Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Meaning of Catholic. This is the Paleocrat Diaries, and I'm your host for the Ecumenical Councils. My name is Jake Fowler. Welcome to Part 9. Part 9. My goodness, we've covered... Well, we started just a little bit before the Council of Nicaea, which convened in 325, and here we are sitting about the year 484, so about 160 years. We've got a lot of ground to cover today. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We've only talked about, what, three councils, four maybe? We've got to get 21. So here we go. We've got open schism in the church. We've got Rome and Constantinople at odds. Pope Felix III and Acacius, they couldn't see eye to eye over the Monophysite question. Zeno's Henoticon, the formula of union that the emperor wanted to kind of push onto the church, the pope didn't like it. It gave in too much. Acacius signed it, and it was the cause of division between the two sees, between Rome and Constantinople. Let's take up where we left off. Let me turn down my music. All right. Track down my outline. There it is. Okay. When we were discussing the 460s, which I believe was last episode, there was a quick series of deaths. We have the same thing going on here. So a few years after the Acacian Schism began in 484, we have one, two, three, four, five, six people, important people, dying and being replaced. So let me start from the top. Peter the Laundryman. He was Patriarch of Antioch. He died in 488 AD and was replaced by a man named Paladinus. Then you have Acacius, around whom the schism sort of centered and for whom it's named. He died in 489, succeeded by a man named Fravita. Fravita died just a few months later, also in 489, and he's succeeded by a man named Euphemius, who was a Syrian from the land of Nestorius, if you recall. Next up, we have Peter the Horse. That's H-O-A-R-S-E. He was Patriarch of Alexandria. He was put there, remember, after there was a little dust-up. Timothy White Turban, who was the Orthodox Patriarch, a gentle old man, right? He just wanted to mind his own business and for everybody to get along. Well, he wanted an Orthodox successor, and so he sends this deacon, or, or, or whatever he was, John Talia. He sends him to Constantinople. And he wants him to make a deal with the emperor and with the patriarch. And they say, that's fine, except you can't do it, John. Well, John was the one who was chosen when he had come back uh, to Alexandria. And so they needed a reason to not accept John. And so they said, well, you need to sign this Henoticon. And John refused to sign it. So they saw, well, we need somebody who will. And they found this Peter the Horse who was the illicitly ordained bishop uh, by Timothy the Cat, the Monophysite. So we've got these dual lines of succession creeping in. So Peter the Horse died in 490, and he's succeeded by another Monophysite, Athanasius II. This Athanasius did not live up to his namesake's heroic reputation. The next year, in 491, Emperor Zeno dies, and he is succeeded by Anastasius I. This is a, a, an odd man. He's sort of older at the time. He's very austere, and he has a very interesting job. He was the silenciary of the imperial palace, meaning this is the guy who would go around at night making sure everyone is nice and quiet, so the emperor can get some rest. This man, Anastasius, he's a committed Monophysite, and he's now sitting on the imperial throne. Last but not least, Felix III, the pope who excommunicated Acacius of Constantinople, he dies in 492, 
and is succeeded by Gelasius I, who's from North Africa. Wow. So here we are, just as before, about 20, 25 years before, the players have changed, the game remains the same. The Hinaticon of Zeno, this is that formula of union that I had mentioned, has been and will remain the official policy for about 30 years or so. And Anastasius I, he enforced it uh, during his reign. He enforced it quite strictly. He says the text of it can be interpreted in a Catholic way, but he knows that it also can be interpreted in a heretical way. This ambiguity that exists in the edict, it led to what you might call an apparent peace, but underneath the surface, tensions were bubbling up. They were pretty strong. The rivalries continued. Recall, we've got the Antiochenes and the Alexandrians, and they don't typically get along. At one time, they were all on the same team. Now, we're not so sure about that. Each side desired the other one's interpretation to be condemned. Anastasius, for his part, he brought in some theological advisors, and they were both monophysites. He has, on the one hand, Philoxenus of a place called Mabug, and then on the other hand, a certain Severus of Antioch. In the year 506, so we've jumped forward a little bit, in about 506 or maybe 507, Philoxenus began to make waves regarding the theologians whose writings would later become known as the three chapters. I'm referring to Theodore of Mopsuestia. This would have been Nestorius's mentor, Theodoret of Cyrus, or Cyrus, and Ebas of Edessa. Theodore had died in 428 in communion with the church, I might add. But Philoxenus wants to condemn, or rather attack, his person and his works. Theodoret of Cyrus died in 458. He had been restored as personally orthodox by the Council of Chalcedon. And Philoxenus is writing against Cyrus, uh, Theodoret's writings. So Philoxenus takes issue with Theodoret's writings and with Theodore's writings and him personally. And finally, Ebus of Edessa, there were a couple of letters, one in particular, but I think there were two or three that were sort of suspicious to the Monophysite-leaning prelates at the time. And Philoxenus, being a Monophysite, he writes against these letters that were written or presumed to have been written by Ebus of Edessa. Ebus died in 457. So here we are, 50 to 80 years after the deaths of these three men, and Philoxenus is sort of stirring the pot, if you will. He also agitated against his metropolitan, a man named Flavian, Flavian II of Antioch. He had succeeded Palladinus as patriarch there. Flavian was a staunch Chalcedonian. Philoxenus was a Monophysite. The Monophysites believed Chalcedon was a Nestorian council. They thought it was heretical because it speaks of this two natures in the person of Christ. And it doesn't take up Cyril's language as firmly as they would have liked. And I believe, I could be wrong about this, I guess I could check my Denzinger, that at Chalcedon, the phrase one incarnate nature of the divine word is not used. They speak about the one person of Christ, they speak about his two natures, but they don't say one incarnate nature of the divine word. If we recall, this was Cyril's banner of orthodoxy. This is what Dioscorus picked up and ran with. But it ultimately had come from Apollinaris of Laodicea, who was himself a heretic. It had been sold under Athanasius's name, the good Athanasius, not Athanasius II. But I digress. In 512... The emperor, Anastasius, 
made Severus of Antioch the patriarch. Now, Severus is regarded as perhaps the brain trust of the Monophysite cause. Very intelligent man. And this comes about, I mentioned just a second ago, Flavian II was Patriarch of Antioch, and now Severus is Patriarch of Antioch. A long battle between Flavian II, between Philoxenus, between Severus, between Anastasius, all of them were sort of raging against the lawful patriarch. Ultimately, this led to his deposition, even, even after he condemned the Antiochene theologians. I'm referring to these fellows who we now call uh, the authors of the three chapters, Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodoret of Cyrus, and Ibas of Edessa. He condemned them. He condemns Nestorius by name. He condemned the definition of Chalcedon, and he condemned those who held two natures in Christ. That was still not enough. Why? Why was that not enough? I, I think, this is just me speaking here, that Anastasius knew that Flavian II didn't mean any of that. I think he knew that he was Chalcedonian at heart, that he was an Orthodox Catholic, and that these condemnations were simply to keep his job. That's my belief. Whatever the case may be, Flavian II is out, Severus is in. Now, Severus doesn't have an easy go of it either. He's met with struggle on both sides because he's something of a moderate. When you're attacked by both sides, that's usually a sign that you're very well balanced and that you've got something of the truth about you. I don't know that we can say that about Severus. To the Monophysites, he was too moderate. He didn't go far enough. To the Chalcedonians, he was a heretic. He went too far. And then you had these so-called Neo-Chalcedonians. These were folks who endeavored to show that Chalcedon was a Cyrillian council and not a Nestorian one. In other words, they wanted to say that the hypostatic union was congruent with Leo's tome, although Leo didn't use the word in his letter. And they didn't use the word at the council. They didn't say hypostatic union, to my knowledge. Severus, he wages a, a, a theological war, which would have taken place via letter, via preaching, via conversations with important people, notably Anastasius I, the emperor. He wages this war against the patriarch of Jerusalem, a man named Elias. Elias was a Chalcedonian, or at least it seemed so. There was a letter, you see, that was released by the government after there was some, uh, shall we say, agitation or maybe civil unrest. There were some disturbances of the peace in Palestine. Some monks were stirring up trouble. And they, the government, somehow they got a hold of this letter, purportedly written by Elias of Jerusalem, that showed that Elias had some, some doubts or hesitations about the council. What exactly? I, I, I can't say. I'm not sure. But it was enough for him to lose the support of his most fanatical and devoted monks. He was exiled just a few years later in 516. So Severus has already claimed Flavian of Antioch as a victim, and now Elias of Jerusalem in less than five years. To replace Elias, they're obviously going to want to choose a Monophysite. And there was a deacon named John. He was a guardian of the Holy Cross. And he was appointed after agreeing to condemn the Council of Chalcedon and Leo's tome. But resistance mounted. 
the monks, the, the people of Palestine, they were still orthodox at this point. There was an Archimandrite, Sabas. An Archimandrite is sort of like a head abbot, someone who would be just under a bishop, canonically speaking. In fact, a lot of Archimandrites became bishops. Um, if you recall, Nestorius was one of these guys. So Sabas, who is an Archimandrite in Palestine, who was an admirer of Theodore of Mopsuestia, I should add, he leads the resistance to this deacon, John, being appointed the Patriarch of Jerusalem by the Emperor. John is, again, agreeing to condemn Chalcedon. He's agreeing to condemn Leo's tome. And Sabas doesn't like that. But John was later installed, and he was presented before a large crowd in St. Stephen's, named for the proto-martyr. But when he appeared before the crowd, who is at his side except this same Archimandrite, Sabas? What does this mean? Well, it seems to me that Sabas met with John, and they made a deal. He must have convinced him of his errors to some degree, because John's first act as Patriarch of Jerusalem was to declare his adherence to the four councils as to the four holy gospels. He also condemns the Monophysite heresy. So with Sabas's influence, John flips. He was sort of leaning Monophysite, and now he's on the side of the Chalcedonians, the Orthodox side. The tide is turning. Chalcedonian Orthodoxy is now on the rise. The bishops are starting to come around. I just mentioned John. The bishops of Illyria and Macedonia the same way. They supported the council. They supported Chalcedon, and they wanted communion with Rome. Timothy of Constantinople, the new patriarch, he was still a Monophysite, but a moderate one. Maybe this is someone we can get along with. Maybe despite our differences, we can reconcile, we can heal the Acacian schism. The Pope at this time is a man named... Simacus. We're sitting at about the year 513. I had mentioned Elias's exile in 516, but then I jumped back. I should have mentioned that. So here we are in about the year 513. Anastasius is getting very frustrated. He had to deal with an uprising that same year that threatened his rule. There was a man, a man named Vitalian. He was a pretty able army general from the Danubian province, the, the sort of uh, modern-day Hungary, somewhere in there. And Vitalian had aligned himself with the Chalcedonians so as to better oppose Anastasius. Vitalian rallied the troops and marched on Constantinople. And the emperor, seeing the writing on the wall, he has no choice but to make a deal. So he and Vitalian agree to call a council under the presidency of the new pope, Hormisdas. Simacus had died in 514. Vitalian ensured that the idea for a council was simply a suggestion. Anastasius went along with this. He says, oh, sure, we'll just propose it. To the Holy Father. We're not actually going to call a council because you know in those days when the emperor called a council, the bishops went. That's how that worked. So Anastasius agrees with Vitalian. He says, we're going to suggest it. We're not going to call the council. We're going to let Hormisdas decide. He was amenable to the idea. Pope Hormisdas says, yeah, sure, let's have a council. But he required that Anastasius I and all of the Eastern bishops bow down to certain conditions. They must subscribe to these criteria. Number one, they have to affirm Chalcedon and Leo's tome, the emperor and the bishops. 
Number two, they must condemn Nestorius, Eutyches, Dioscorus, Timothy the cat, Peter the horse, Peter the laundryman, and Acacius. And three, they have to recall and retry any deposed or exiled Catholic bishops. This would include Flavian of Antioch and Elias of Jerusalem. Before the council could materialize, before any of this could really take shape and be put in play, Vitalian's resistance died out and Anastasius was emboldened to resist the Holy Father. He found reasons why he couldn't or shouldn't go with these conditions that Hormisdus had laid out. The council, which was set for Heraclea, did not convene. At this point, we've moved up to about the year 518. Anastasius I, old man though he was, he reigned for a long time, looking at about 491 to 518, somewhere in the neighborhood of 27 years. The former silentiary of the palace, he died, and he's replaced by a Latin, not a Greek. Justin I, on July 10th of 518. Justin's nephew worked closely with him. This man was also an ardent Catholic, and he would later have a remarkable role to play, as we will see. Of course, I'm referring to Justinian. Justin was a military commander. He was a palace guard. He was old. Most emperors were old. And he was a devoted Catholic. He was quick to act to reestablish relations with Rome. Within 10 days, on July 20th of his accession, within 10 days of his accession, therefore on July 20th, a group of bishops held a synod. They were led by John II of Constantinople, the new patriarch. 44 bishops in all attended, and they condemned the Monophysite heresy, and they affirmed Chalcedon. So we're part of the way toward Hormisdus' conditions. Eastern bishops, and presumably the emperor, since it would have been his idea, they're condemning Monophysitism, they're affirming Chalcedon. All we have left to do now is name some heretics. On August 1st, another couple of weeks, Justin I wrote to Pope Hormisdus asking for his prayers. And on August 6th, a synod in Jerusalem repeated that which was done at Constantinople. So again, Eastern bishops falling in line with the Pope's demands. You want to be back in communion with Rome? Here's what you have to do. First at Constantinople, next at Jerusalem, by the end of September, six weeks later, seven weeks later, Severus of Antioch, who was the intellectual leader of the Monophysite party, he was an outlaw. He fled to Egypt, the stronghold of the Monophysite heresy, and he took shelter in Alexandria. Pope Hormisdus responds to all of these actions by sending five papal legates to the capital. In January 519, they arrive. Among these legates is a very capable deacon, Dioscorus. This Dioscorus is a good guy. Now, the legates brought with them from Rome what is known as the Formula of Hormisdus. It's essentially... The exact same thing that the Holy Father wanted the emperor and the Eastern bishops to do in order to have this council at Heraclea. This was the thing that Anastasius I had excused himself from. He found reasons why he couldn't or shouldn't go along with Hormisdus's conditions. 
Justin, po politician, right? Even though he is a faithful Catholic, he's a politician. He attempts to negotiate with the legates. But seeing their refusal, they were prepared to leave. They have strict instructions from Pope Hormisdus. Here are the terms, and the Easterners can take them or leave them. When Justin recognizes that these guys aren't negotiating, he acquiesced. The bishops of the East signed it also, and this ends the Acacian Schism, which had persisted in the church since the year 484. If I'm doing my math properly, that's about 35 years. A couple of comments on the formula of Hormistus. First of all, there's a statement here about the necessity of adhering to Rome in order to know and keep the true faith which leads to salvation. What is it about communion with Rome that's so essential? Hormistus seems to think that it's pretty key for the church to be in union with the apostolic see. We Catholics would agree with this. Father Adrian Fortescue, a British priest around uh, the, the 1900s, early 1900s, he says, to be in communion with the body of Christ requires being in communion with the chief member of the body. The chief member being the successor of St. Peter, who was chief among the apostles. Father Fortescue has a great book on this, by the way, called The Early Papacy. Can't recommend it highly enough. Back to Hormisdus's, uh, the, the formula, the statement that the legates carried with them from Rome. There's a reference to Matthew chapter 16. This should not surprise us. This is the, the locus classicus for papal primacy. Upon this rock I will build my church, so says our Lord to Peter. Hormisdus recognizes that this text is pretty key when it comes to understanding Rome's authority. Furthermore, there's a statement about the apostolic see keeping the faith spotlessly. And at this point, I have to wonder, what about Pope Liberius? Liberius signed a semi-Arian creed in the 350s. Was the sea spotless? Yes, we can answer, because Liberius was under duress. He was coerced, and the fact remains, he was old. And these kind of things happen. Any document produced or procured any signature obtained under coercion is invalid. We would all agree to that, I hope. So Hormistus can then rightfully say that the See of Rome is indeed spotless and that the other churches, the Eastern churches in particular, must hold communion with her if they are to know and keep the true faith that leads to salvation. Let me check the time. 29 minutes, maybe just a little bit more. There were some mixed reactions to the formula of Hormistus. That shouldn't surprise us. People always disagree about papal documents. Think of the one just last year, a certain motu proprio. Hormistus received the same sort of thing. Some repudiated it. Others celebrated it. In Ephesus, they rejected the formula, and they condemned Chalcedon. In Antioch, they celebrated Theodoret, and get this, they held a giant party for St. Nestorius. Perhaps a bridge too far. Alexandria, the Monophysite stronghold, they were unmoved. Even after the patriarch died, Justin I did not try to force an Orthodox bishop upon them. 
but he rather allows another monophysite to arise to the patriarchal throne, Timothy III. I suppose we should call it there. Cue the ending music. There we go. Okay, so we've made it through 484 to about 519, 520, somewhere in there. Justin I is emperor, Hormizdus is pope, and we've got a mixture of Catholic and Monophysite bishops spread throughout the East. The schism is formally healed, but the problems don't just go away. People's minds don't just change that easily. We know this. Next time, we'll pick up right where we are now in about the year 520. We'll cover probably most, if not all, of the reign of Justinian. And we're working our way towards the next council, namely Constantinople II. Uh, actually, now that I think of it, we will not get through Justinian's reign because we must spend some time speaking about Pope Vigilius. All right. I suppose that's enough for, for one day. And I'll close as we always do. Here at Paleocrat Diaries, we never give up. We keep on smiling. And we memento mori. Good night.